is a Grab the Mic webinar from the Beam Exchange. Uh, my name is Mike Albu. I'm the uh, director of the Beam Exchange, which is a global platform for sharing information and knowledge about market systems development. And uh, one of the things we like to do is provide a space for organizations with, with experience and lessons to share. And today we're very privileged to have three speakers from the PRISMA program in Indonesia. Um, they, they, are, they all introduced the PRISMA program in more detail, but let me just quickly tell you who the speakers are. So we've got Nina Fitzsimmons, who's the CEO of PRISMA. This is a large program in Indonesia. She has um, 25 years experience in this field, so she's well qualified to talk about um, what, she's, what uh, they're going to talk about. But she's supported actually by two of her colleagues who are, who are going to present um, most of the interesting um, stories about their experience. Um, and they, they are Mahasin Kabir, who's the Chief Technical Officer for Prisma, and uh, he's got about 15 years experience in the MSD field, and Prajwal Shahi, who is the Portfolio Advisor for Prisma and particularly works on the, um, the pig and uh, mechanization sectors for Prisma. So they're going to be talking about navigating and bouncing back from market shocks, and that's a that's a really topical issue um, in the, in our in the Beam Exchange and more widely. I think in the field we know that that shocks, economic shocks, um, natural disasters, climate related shocks, you know, these things are very much part of what now shapes the world that we live in, and uh, it's really important that market systems development as a field is is keyed into how we work with our work and support communities around shocks and bouncing back and recovering from shocks it's all part of the what we call the market systems resilience agenda so these three speakers are going to be very um, informative from what I've seen and they'll tell you about how they've managed these issues in the Prisma program in Indonesia so um, before I hand over don't forget the Q&A box for your questions I'll, co I'll come to that when they finish speaking in about half an hour and I'll be drawing on your questions to to keep the debate going but, in, but before we get to the Q&A please um, I'll hand over the microphone I'll let them grab the mic to Nina and her colleagues Nina great thank you Mike and it's just wonderful to be back on Beam Exchange um, before we get started um, I'll get Mohassan to be my slide manager and go to the first slide um, I'd like to take the time just to introduce Prisma just a little bit. This is probably the boring stuff and I'll spend a little less time on this slide so that we can get to the more exciting slide. But I just wanted to present a couple of um, facts on Prisma just so that you can understand the size and complexity of the program. So we're currently in our second phase of a 10 year investment and currently in the ninth year. We're, as Mike said, a very large MSD program. We're based in Indonesia, so Salamat Malam, Unto Kawan Kawan, Indonesia. We work in the agricultural sector. To date, we've already reached 1.2 million farming households in terms of direct impact. And we've done that through 264 private sector partners. Now, like every other MSD program that's probably online, our focus is really on scale, sustainability and resilience. But the one thing that we've learned on Prisma is that disaster can strike. So I'd like to introduce you to two farmers. These are smallholder farmers from Eastern Indonesia, um, Flores. Um, this is Michaelia and Cassianos, and they're smallholder farmers. Now in Eastern Indonesia, Pig business is big business, and that's mainly because pigs are actually part of the cultural fabric of Eastern Indonesia. However, most farmers actually raise their pigs traditionally, so smallholder farmers like Michaela and Cassianos would only have one or two pigs. They would raise them traditionally by feeding them with forage and with household scraps, and there's no such thing as pig pens. They would just usually tie a rope around the leg and stake it into the ground. So before Prisma came in and started we working on the feed function, it would take about two years for farmers like Michaela and Cassianos to fatten a pig big enough to be able to sell. 
So when Prisma came in, um, it really changed the lives of Michaelia and Cassianos, and they actually increased their pig drift to 25 pigs annually. And this also, you know, significantly increased their income as well so that they were able to make investments. But in 2020, African swine fever hit Indonesia, Eastern Indonesia, and this had huge impacts on the, uh, the pig industry. So next slide, after ASF, Michaeli and Cassianos lost all their pigs, as did every other or nearly every other farmer in Eastern Indonesia. And they were really back to, to square one. So with Prisma, we'd actually increased the pig population in Eastern Indonesia by 50% through our feed functions. And that was only really directly impacting 22% of the total pig population. But what Prisma hadn't done is to actually think of the epidemiological impacts or the epidemiological risks of actually increasing the pig population so quickly. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to hand over to Prajwal and he'll explain in more detail what it actually was that we did in the pig sector. So over to you, um, Prajwal. Thank you, Nina, for that great introduction. So let me just walk you through the pig sector. Pig are the most important livestock for nearly 900,000 smallholder farmers uh, with the pig population of 2.2 million pigs in 2019 in East Nusa Tangara, also known as Entity. This is a province in the southernmost part of Indonesia and pig farming is an integral part of their local culture with very high women involvement. And despite the importance of pig in the province, pig farmer experience low productivity and income due to limited access to information and products such as quality feed, breed and animal health services, which has also led to poor rating practices. However, Prisma work in the pig sector began in 2014 and focused on breeding since farmer mainly used um, local breeds instead of crossbred or purebred pigs. But many farmers struggled to purchase high quality piglets as the market traction was low due to cost. But there was a strong interest in the feed component. So in 2016, Prisma shifted its focus to the, to the feed component by promoting quality feed and good rating practices. By partnering with two companies, seeing strong farmers' interest, nine more companies entered the market. So by 2019, the feed business was booming with nearly 112,000 farming households using commercial feed and improved rating practices. And using commercial feed, um, half the fattening a period for pigs, reduced uh, feeding time, and thereby allowing women to have more free time and increase farmer income by nearly 415%. Unfortunately, triple shock hit the market. African swine fever, 2019, COVID-19 since April 2020, and the third deadliest tropical cyclone, Saroja, hit in April 2021. These three shocks killed more than 50% of the pig population, leading to farmers' income loss, mostly due to pig deaths, uh, farm products not being able to be marketed, and crop failure due to cyclone, really bringing the pig sector back to square one. However, this was not the only catastrophic shock to impact a sector. Yeah, so um, as well as those three um, shocks impacting the pig sector, and I suppose the other shock was that Prajwal lost all his hair. Um, but, <laughs> sorry, Prajwal. We, um, we, ASF was, and, and the loss of Prajwal's hair wasn't the only catastrophic shock. We also had other catastrophic shocks. I'd like to introduce you. This is another farmer. His name is Kanjin. I had the pleasure of meeting him. He's one of 4.8 million smallholder cattle farmers in um, eastern and central Indonesia. 
like with the pig sector, the cattle sector, we also transformed the feed sector within the cattle market. And for example, there were only 2% of um, farmers using concentrate feed um, at the beginning of our work in cattle. And um, by uh, you know, 2022, we have had 81 um, private sector partners working in cattle feed. But in 2022, as you probably all know from the news, foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease hit Indonesia. And Actually, it was at the time that ASF hit in 2020, um, I actually became CEO of Prisma. So even though I've been involved in Prisma since the beginning, I became CEO in 2020. And I really had to ask myself, what can we do to actually increase the resilience of these markets that we're working in? Because really, I saw that, you know, particularly for feed, the feed sectors, there was a great risk that everything that we had worked for would be for naught. So I had to make some difficult decisions on a program level. Next slide, please. I realized that as a leader and as a team, we actually didn't have the luxury that we had in 2013, where we had lots of time to experiment, lots of time to pilot, lots of time to do blue sky thinking. Prisma has only got one year left. Thankfully, I think we're going to get an extension to December 2024. But in terms of recognizing the need to build resilience, we had to really do some crucial things at a program level. Um, some of the things that we did is that we did have a permanent function on intelligence gathering, but that was very inward focused. What we did is that we adjusted that intelligence gathering to start collecting behavioral data, both on farmers and on the private sector to see how they were actually responding to these shocks so that we could then look at how we could readjust our portfolio. One of the things that we did, which is so hard to do on an MSD program, is to really step back and actually re-strategize the entire portfolio. So you can imagine with the whole management team saying, guys, we have to stop what we've been doing and actually really look at what we can do to actually increase the breadth and depth of the work that we're doing. So Mohassan will take over in a little while to explain what it is that we did at the market level. The other thing that we did is, I mean, all MSD programs focus on adaptive management, but we had to build in super adaptive management. Now, luckily for us, we had a really um, understanding and flexible donor. Our donor is DFAT, and we were able to work with the rural development team and bring them on board. They came on board very quickly in terms of our strategy refresh, and they allowed us to change some parts of our um, contract to enable us to have the resources we need to undertake the work that we needed to do as a as part of the strategy reflex. And in addition to that, we had to look at how we could actually build a little bit more flexibility within our own systems and working with um, headquarters with Palladium to develop contracts that would allow us to do what we wanted to do at the um, sector level. So now I'll actually hand it over to Mohassan, my chief technical officer, who will explain what it is that we did at the sector level. Mohassan, over to you. Thanks, Nina. So with the program level strategy adjustments, we had to go through the strategy reset for all the sectors. However, the fundamental principle remained the same, being super flexible uh, in terms of uh, management and strategy adjustment. So we'll talk about all these strategies in a minute, but before that, let me just explain very quickly um, when you say the uh, word resilience, what actually we mean by resilience. Now, if you go back and um, you know, look at from the program's perspective, what is our goal? We want to improve the lives of the poor. And if a program is following a facilitation approach, we want to do that by working with the market actors. And they are the private sector who plans and delivers effectively, and they are a government who enables these, and the poor people themselves, they also change their behavior. Um, and, and, and the program tries to you know, bring in some behavior changes amongst all these market actors. Now, once that behavior change becomes normal, we say that the uh, system has a minimum level of resilience. Now, we have seen during COVID that even a new normal can go back to the original practice. 
So Prisma really went back and look at the understanding of um, resilience. And we identified at least three uh, most important components that must be there in a resilient market system. So number one is that the market actors who have changed their behavior must have enough skills and capacities to continue even if there is a shock. And we'll talk about what we have done. There were some fundamental changes the way we design and implement our activities. The second is that there must be more than enough market actors offering the same services so that even during a um, crisis period, the farmers or the poor people will have access to some uh, services or similar services and products. And finally, often the, what program intends to do is that they want to implement all the as long as possible towards end of the program, they are still implementing activities. Prisma intentionally decided that we need to look at whether this can continue without the program support, without, without the aid support. And that's why we have decided to discontinue, complete our interventions way before the program ends so that we can measure. And if possible, we can take all, you know, uh, measures to, to, to make sure that the system has the minimum level of um, residence. Now, with that understanding, we looked at um, the sector and we realized that you know, going by the book or doing business as usual was no longer an option. So what we followed, we followed a mix of uh, direct and indirect facilitation approach. Now we did not, we did not, you know, go away from the systemic vision. We had added a direct delivery component, but with a systemic change vision. If you look at the sector, Prazol talked about the peak sector. Once before the um, the, the crisis happened, it was the lucrative sector for the feed companies. But during the crisis, feed companies did not have any incentive because all the farmers lost their interdrift of pigs. Similarly, the breeders, they did not have any incentive because the farmers, they did not want to restart their farming. They were not confident. So educating and building awareness amongst the farmers became uh, the most important activity. But as you know, this is this has a public goods nature. So nobody wants to start. And Prisma had to start somewhere. And Prisma started with almost 100% investment. But as I said, that the systemic transition was there. So we, what we did, we came up with short-term, medium-term, and long-term strategies. And the direct delivery component only um, was part of the short-term strategy how we uh, made sure that we can um, you know, clearly exit from the, from the short-term uh, strategy. We had clear milestones, measurable milestones, and we diligently measured uh, those milestones and we tried to see whether on the right track or not. Once we saw that the farmers, they have an increased understanding and they're applying the most significant biosecurity approach to the um, private sector and we showed them the business opportunity. Slowly but surely, they understood the private sector. They understood that uh, the market is restarting, and they started um, also restocking their piglets and you know started their operation. So since then, we focused on the commercial viability of business models. We came up with different business models. We helped them, the companies, to test and try and improve those business models. We also added additional activities with the um, with our partners to ensure that there is built-in redundancy and adaptability. For example, we are now working with the breeders in the pig sector, and we have added activities like building in-house capacity, investing in um, green infrastructure, for example, waste management, and also having improved uh, networking and agency with the relevant market actors. Moving on to um, what else we did um, and we had to do. We wanted to reach as many pigs farmers as possible during the crisis period. So we worked with all the possible and potential market actors. And this was also necessary to ensure that the system has improved resilience. So if there are more than enough market actors providing the similar services, then even during a crisis, there would be uh, some service providers with improved resilience. They will continue providing those services. So farmers will continue having, those, um, having access to those services. 
And finally, government plays a big role. So when you talk about the peak sector in Indonesia, we, we are talking about one of the provinces named NTT, and their government plays a very big role. And they are the most credible sources of information and education for the farmers. But during African swine fever, government was also helpless because it was something unknown to them, it was new. So Prisma had to invest with the government and Prisma ended up investing a little bit also in the fixed assets. In an ideal situation, Prisma would have just approached to the private sector based on co-investment principle, we could have implemented our activities. Now that was um, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, the uh, sector level strategies, but we did not stop there actually. We looked at um, the uh, you know, wholesome, wholesale changes at the, at the program level. And we realized that the sector level strategy adjustment cannot be just a one-off activity. So what do we did? So all the sectors, not only just the peak sector, the beef sector, all the sectors went through a strategy refresh. The strategy refresh identified additional functions, uh, reprioritized some functions, and uh, then focused on building resilience. Initially, it was not that easy because seven, eight years, we were used to you know, design interventions in one way. And suddenly the sector team, they were asking questions to the senior management team. You know, they were saying that our strategy looks absolutely fine. It can generate numbers. It can benefit a large number of people. Why should we change the sector strategies? So there was a lot of, uh, you know, a cultural thing and we had to invest in, you know, creating a conducive culture as well. So we had to convince um, our internal staff um, and thankfully Donor was very proactive and they, they they were they were on board very quickly and we added the um uh, resilience criteria in terms of our sector review so often we do the review of all the sector strategies and we focus on the key achievements for example how many farmers you're reaching how many companies you are working with what is the investment leverage what else we can do but resilience is something that comes towards end of the review what we did during the strategy refresh we added resilience as an criteria. Now that created an incentive for the internal staff to go beyond, to think out of the box and to come up with uh, innovative ideas. It was really challenging because we were reallocating resources to improve the resilience, which might not give additional numbers, but which will ensure that you know, the changes that we are bringing in will continue and will last longer. So with all these changes, how does the, um, you know, the peak sector looks like. Prazol will talk about the, the peak sector now. Over to you, Prazol, you are on mute. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Pam Masin. I'll now some, uh, share some of the trends that's happening now. Restocking has become a priority and Prisma focus on breed and animal health has improved the sector's resilience to future shock. Prisma supported 38 private and public sector actors to increase farmers' access to quality inputs, information, and knowledge in the breed, feed, and animal husbandry areas. By early 2023, pig farmers have started restocking and are now adopting better biosecurity measures to prevent disease outbreaks. Breeding farms are now investing more in pig farming, and this is a good sign towards re sector recovery. And breeding farms are now focusing more on improving genetics and piglet production. Secondly, commercializing artificial insemination products and services. Third, um, wastewater treatment plant for recycling uh, biogas and compost. Currently, eight of our breeding farms are now producing and selling fresh or chilled semen and providing artificial insemination services in rural areas. And two of our partners are, have applied water waste treatment plants. The introduction of chilled semen straws for artificial insemination has increased the product life from uh, one to two hours since from collection to three to five days. This longer shelf life has enabled uh, inter-island semen trading in the province, and the chilled semen straws are disease-free, safer, cheaper, and easier to transport. 
Prisma also partnered with the Provincial Animal Husbandry Offices, which has led to a comprehensive ASF prevention, detection, and surveillance strategy. And as part of the strategy, Prisma has helped build capacity of all government uh, animal health workers and lab personnel in, in the province related to ASF prevention and surveillance. Parallelly, ASF campaign was launched in 2022 to reach a broader range of stakeholders and uh, farmers across all 22 districts of the province. The campaign has disseminated ASF and FMD related information and uh, biosecurity measures and practices through provincial uh, and district animal husbandry workers, private and public uh, market actors, university students, uh, church members, and also various veterinary associations. And a recent assessment of the farmers uh, earlier this year has indicated that the ASF campaign has reached nearly 650,000 smallholder farmers. And these farmers are now applying at least one or two biosecurity measures. Also, uh, Prisma reset recently handed a diagnostic tool to the provincial government, which has opened access to animal testing in the three major islands of the province. And farmers and big sector market actors have now better access to ASF testing facilities with quick, reliable, and cost-efficient services. For all the areas of work, uh, the provincial and district governments have allocated budgets for ASF detection, um, surveillance, and testing. And this has really boosted their morale to provide better services to farmers. And finally, feed sales have bounced back and um, this is a very good sign towards how the sector is recovering and farmers are restocking. As some of our partners are experiencing, sales uh, achieved similar to before ASF uh, of 2019. Also, there seems to be an increase in demand for lactating and pregnant sows uh, feed. And one of our partners has diversified to cater to this market by providing such products. And thirdly, a great sign of recovery has been that the market is currently exper experiencing crowding in by competing partners uh, of different brands of products. And two new feed companies have recently entered the market. I, I mean, to summarize, uh, these are all great signs of recovery and a step towards building a resilient uh, pig market. However, uh, in this process, we have learned some great lessons and Pa Mohasin will share some of those lessons, lessons in his next slide. Thank you. Thanks, Braswell. Um, so impressive. Prisma reached uh, 650,000 pig farmers um, within, a, within a year. And um, we have learned great lessons uh, from this experience. And um, there are a lot of lessons related to the sector strategy, but uh, some of the lessons I want to share related to uh, the program process that could be applied across countries and programs. So often what we do, we consider risks and shocks the last things um, you know, while designing interventions. Also big shocks like COVID or African swine fever was completely unknown or unimaginable for to the current generation. But now we know that um, the scale of such disaster could be like um, throughout, throughout the world. So we have to factor in all big shocks from the very beginning. And how can we identify these shocks? We have to go beyond the geographical boundary. An example could be if a program is working in Indonesia uh, in the maize sector, you cannot just focus on Indonesia and the maize sector. Um, two years ago, there was a fall armyworm and it was uh, immersed in Africa and less than two years, it traveled to Indonesia. And similar things happened with uh, African swine fever. It was first identified in China and less than a year, it was in Indonesia. So you have to really go beyond the geographical boundary and, and, and keep your eyes open um, to identify the big shocks and, and, and risks coming. The third one is that you know, it is necessary to identify and factor in the new risk.
to mainstream the resilience along the program life cycle. It is the sector team who goes to the field every day to, on a day-to-day -day basis, they collect information, they know what are the risks emerging and things like that. So they need to understand and they need to consider the big shocks and risks while they analyze, they implement, they monitor. Finally, all these big strategic um, decisions can only work if the program has flexibility in terms of resourcing. So there has to be a common understanding amongst the senior management of the program and also amongst the donor communities that during such a crisis, the program needs to be adaptive and they can reallocate the resources. Unless this happens, nothing will work. So with that note, I will stop here and um, would be happy to answer questions. And we'll also um, you know, offer our cooperation if there is any, any further queries, we'd be happy to take that on beyond this um, webinar. So over to Mike. Well, many thanks, Mohsin, and also Prajwal and Nina, really interesting presentation, very interesting. Um, we've got about half an hour left now, um, because the speakers have been uh, efficient in their estimation of their, their time, and we've got plenty of time to answer questions. In fact, I can see that Nina's already been answering a few questions in the Q&A box directly, but let's let's bring the conversation out into the open. Um, please do, if you have, if your thoughts are now stirring and you're getting new, new questions you wanna raise, put them in the Q&A box, but let's have a look at some of the questions that have already been placed there. Maybe we should start, Nina, with, with a question from Mestawat Ketema in Ethiopia, who was essentially asking, how did you manage to convince the donor, uh, Difat, to um, to allow you to pivot your strategy and refresh and, and adopt this kind of adaptive approach. You're, you're, Nina, mute. you're on mute. I don't think I can get through any Zoom meeting without that coming to me. Okay, um, a really great question. Um, we're very lucky in terms of our um, donors because um, we've had the same activity manager for um, the last nine years. So she's really on top of what we're doing technically. So what we had to do is, I mean, we kind of had this agreement um, with our activity manager, Lulu. I think she's even on online tonight um, that, you know, no surprises. So she knew um, about ASF. She also knew, well, we all knew about COVID, um, but it was actually about presenting the program logic and why it made sense to actually focus more on resilience. And actually you asked this in terms of an, you know, um, an MSD um, approach. The program logic and actually focusing on resilience is actually core to MSD. So for us, it was actually a very easy argument um, to make to the donor. And because of that, um, DFAT were very on board. Um, I suppose the other thing is that we also have quite a flexible contract. So nothing that we needed to do actually required a, a contract amendment. So that made it easier. I think you had a follow up question as well. Um, and that was about how did we deal with the root cause of the disease outbreak? And how do we ensure that um, ASF doesn't come again? I'll actually hand that over to both Prajwal and um, Mohasin. So Mohasin, if you can just deal with that from, you know, an MSD perspective, and then maybe Prajwal can just add a little bit, because there's lots of questions, but just add a little bit on um, some of the key things that we did with government. So Mohasin, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, you know, big shocks, big outbreaks like ASF, you cannot completely the, you know, eradicate that uh, from the world. So future, in future, in the future, this this kind of um, disease outbreak might happen. So you have to you have to accept that. Second, we we actually try to build the capacity of all the stakeholders, including the poor um, uh, pig farmers, that if something happens like this, they can they can um, you know. Uh, they, they can absorb the shocks and they can deal with it. 
So th that is what we focused on. Second is that, um, but we did not stop there. We tried to, um, you know, think in the same line the way you asked the question that uh, can we make sure that it doesn't come uh, in Indonesia again? So we developed the, together with the government and the private sector, we developed uh, the biosecurity and um, we worked with the policymakers, um, you know, in terms of the disease surveillance, what we can do, what the government and private sector needs to do, and how uh, how the poor pig farmers needs to respond if there is a if there is a warning. And with that, we are confident that um, you know the systems in place. If if there is any big shock coming from outside Indonesia, government, private sector, and the farmers, they all are aware, they all are concerned, and they will take appropriate measures so that it doesn't enter. In, in Indonesia. Just one example, after this big um, African swine fever outbreak, uh, there was uh, FMD foot and mouth disease in Indonesia and um, it did not enter into NTT because there was a level of understanding, a level of resilience uh, from the government side and from the private sector side. So they took some measures and this, this was based on the previous experience on African swine fever. Raj, did you have anything to add there? Sure, thanks, uh, Nina. I would like to add one or two things. Uh, from a very strategic perspective, there is no national response strategy to addressing such kind of a disease, especially for pigs. So in late 2019, uh, we worked with the national government to work on a national response strategy uh, for the pig sector. Then only they addressed the issue of this uh, ASF. And uh, to strengthen that, like Pa Mahasin also mentioned, we've worked with the provincial and district government at the provincial level on the surveillance detection and testing uh, to better address these kind of issues. And um, this is one area uh, that obviously needs a lot of um, support and uh, training because this is very new. And no matter for any kind of livestock, it is a similar protocol that we are working on with the provincial government to set up. Thanks, Paj. Thank you, guys. That's fantastic. Um, there's also a question, well, just while we're focusing on the on the, um, the pig sector, and before maybe we, we open it up to look more broadly, um, Monica Frey asked a question about the division of labour in the pig industry, but also about whether there is disease insurance, which I thought was an interesting question. Raj, over to you. Uh, so in terms of division of labor, like I mentioned earlier, women involvement is very high. It's nearly 50, 50%, especially related to rearing part is mostly managed by women. And uh, this working on the feed area was a game changer because earlier the woman had to cut, um, uh, salvage, uh, forage from the forest, cook it and give it uh, to the pig, which kind of took about four to six hours a day. And changing and switching to feed uh, was basically probably half an hour uh, uh, kind of a job. So it really saved a lot of time for the woman, which gave them ample time to do a lot of things. Uh, I hope that I answered the first uh, part of the question. And the second part, there is no form of insurance uh, for livestock, uh, especially for pigs in Indonesia currently. Thank, thanks, Prajwal. Um, let me move on to a question from Maureen, um, which it's quite a long question actually, uh, which Nina's already attempted to address, but I think that the, the key point of it was, how can we make the kind of approach that you've adopted in Prisma more standard uh, in livestock programming and um, are there any examples of, of donor supported market systems working with international private companies on these kinds of approaches? So yeah let me take that question. Um, so we are working with international companies so we uh, you know when we started this um, um, you know, working in the livestock sector, where we did the imp we did the market assessment, and we found that you know, in uh, in the beef sector, for example, less than two percent of the farmers are using good quality feed, and in the pig sector, feed contributes a lot, like the most contributing factor to the productivity increase. 
and there was no feed available uh, for the pig farmer. So we started working with the small companies and then over time we worked with the international companies when the market grew. Now, with the donor funded, when we you know, hear this kind of question, like with the donor funded, can we develop the market system? So there are, there are a few issues that we all need to consider. So as we mentioned, like there has to be a short term and long term strategy. So in the short term, you can use the donor funded money and you must have milestones, measurable milestones that you see, okay, something is going up, the market is ready, then you have to reduce your investment and you have to depend on the co-investment from the private sector. So over time, if you look at Prisma, over, you know, initially the Prisma contribution was around 50% in any intervention. And now it's around 23% on an average. Because now everyone knows the market, the market has grown up uh, during the last uh, seven, eight years and we don't need to invest a lot. So the leverage is quite high. So yeah, using uh, donor money, of course, but uh, if you follow facilitation approach, if you want to reach scale and ensure the sustainability, you have to think about the leveraging the private sector resources. Thank you very much, um, Mohsin. Maybe a, maybe a related follow-up question from Dan Norell. Um, how is the, how is the um, markets, the private sector, how are private sector actors in, in NTT or indeed at a national level adapting to these issues, to these shocks? Are there any uh, emerging industry associations um, or is it very much still just a Prisma and the government? I mean, is there a kind of someone, is there someone moving into this space to take on the role that Prisma has been playing? I think is the, the key question here. Mohasan? Um, I would first give it to Croswell. Maybe you can give some examples sure, of the sectors. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the question. Firstly, yes, I think um, as even our own exit strategy, uh, there is an association. Uh, there are two associations related to pig health, and they are stepping into this role of taking things forward, especially related to ASF awareness and information. The other area is also, they're also taking the lead in terms of probably taking um, the role of providing AI in, um, artificial inseminator uh, services in the future. So we do see there's traction coming from um, and the market responding to this. However, we also see some of the big breeder farmers that we are, uh, they have really increased the investment in terms of how do, they are doing things. I think a good example is because of the importance of biosecurity related to any kind of disease, uh, the wastewater treatment that we mentioned, uh, it cost the partner about $40,000 to set it up. And it was 100% done by them. Our part of the deal was to only provide technical uh, services, uh, a consultant who provided more technical services and linking them to uh, companies that provide or make these kind of uh, products, you know. So what we see is a lot of these roles are being going to be taken up by the private sector and associations in the future. But, but Mike, you were right, you know, initially when we started this, it was only Prisma and the local level kiosks, it was not even the private sector. So when we started back in 2014, that was the situation. And government, as I said, like government played a big role there. But over time, when we showed them the business potential, now not only the um, you know, input companies uh, related to peak sector, but also, for example, the mechanization, um, in the mechanization sector, the agriculture and machinery service providers funding in NTT. And they, they used to use our analysis and market assessments. So there is a big, there, there is a lot of things happening, not only just in the peak sector, but also in the other sectors after seven, eight years. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, there's an interesting point actually. Um, response from Maureen in the chat. And she she's saying um, the point she was really raising is not just about partnering with international companies for finance, but also about working with them for help on intelligence gathering, on epidemiological tracking, and resilience strategies. So perhaps that's something they could provide as part of their um, corporate social responsibility work, for example. Yeah, there are, there are two um, types of actors who are working on the disease surveillance now. 
Uh, first of all, it's the government because um, they are the most credible sources of information. They are the largest organization there. And it's a very thin market. We have to, you know, I have to mention that it's a very thin market. Private sector is not there. And you have to travel like two kilometers to find, you know, 10 farmers. So yeah. that's, that's the, uh, you know, context we were talking about. So we, we helped the uh, government to improve their disease surveillance capacity. And, um, and we are also, uh, you know, uh, advocating for, for them to allocate more budgets in terms of the disease prevention, not only at the province level, but also at the national level. Mm. We are very close to achieve that. And second is with the private sector. Now with the improved capacity, um, they, they have the in-house capacity, they have invested on infrastructure by themselves, as Prazal mentioned. So they, they see the incentive of you know, collecting information and sharing that and educating farmers now. It was, it was not present before. And it was only happened, it, is, uh, it only happened after we worked with them during this crisis period. We provided some direct support, like you know, less than 10% probably in overall portfolio. Uh, but with that support, with that hybrid approach, it actually, uh, you know, drove them to, you know, collect those information and share continuously with the, with the, um, with their network. Mm -hmm. Can I just yeah, add an think... example to that? Sorry, no. sorry, Nina, please go ahead. No, it's just to, to, to raise it even more. I think, um, you know, working, so not just in the pig sector, but in all livestock sector in terms of, um, you know, doing epidemiological um, modelling, which is not something that um, we specialise in. Um, but I, I can see that there is room there um, for international agencies to help the government of Indonesia in terms of doing those epidemiological studies, although there is also plenty of um, domestic talent in that area as well. Um, but in I think one of the things that both Mohassan and Prajwal mentioned that was very important is that it actually is the role of government um, in terms of disease surveillance and um, disease outbreak monitoring. So one of the things that we've been working on and um, also through the cattle um you know, the cattle sector is to actually work with government. We were actually asked to help government do a cost benefit analysis so that they could actually do better budgeting, the kind of budgeting that Prajwal's talking about that he's doing with the provincial government. And one of the things that we would like to do, although that might be taken over by another DFAT health program, is actually to work with and help the national government to change their um, national level regulations to actually make disease monitoring um, and outbreak management part of compulsory budgeting at, at both the national, provincial and um, district level. Um, and of course, then they'll be able to, to do these epidemiological studies themselves. Thank you. Okay. Um... Wow, oh, this is this, there's so much there's so many different directions to go here. I'd like to broaden I'd like to broaden the conversation out a little bit in two ways. Um, one is just about the, the notion of resilience. There's an interesting question from someone who's just called themselves RR, um, really asking about. I mean, you know, we, we're talking about market. We're talking about the resilience of the pig market system here. But what about the resilience of farmers? Is it is it actually a good idea? Maybe we should be, should we perhaps be promoting more diversification of income for house at the household level? Or is, is that so in a, is that so so much less efficient from a terms of local, you know, their economies of scale as, as farmers that it's not a good idea? What do, what do you think? What are the trade-offs between concentrating on intensifying on one product, one, one, one business, if you like, versus income diversification? Yeah, so Can I just make a, uh, one comment sure. on this, and I think it's also contextual. So yeah. in Indonesia, you very rarely only get a pig farmer, or you very rarely only get a rice farmer, or you very rarely only get a maize farmer. Most farmers um, both intercrop and also um, add livestock. Um, but that's contextual, but Mohassan will be able to give you a, a broader um, answer to that question. Yeah, so we actually look at the farmer level resilience as well, but we, we look at from the system's perspective. So um, first of all, we try to look at, okay, uh, there are some behavior changes and farmers are, you know, 
the most important ones. So they change their behavior from using forage to, for example, concentrated feed. And they're, for example, using um, pharmaceutical products for their pigs. Now, we try to look at what are the risks. If we leave now, will the farmers go back to their original practice? And we, we do that analysis. And if that gives us um, you know, some, some, some answers, then we can design something. Uh, we can design an intervention around that. Most of the cases, what we see that um, farmers needs to have more than one choice, more than enough choices, so that they can um, you know, continue having the access to inputs and services. So that is what we try to focus. So we try to uh, induce crowding in, we try to induce responses from the complementary service providers. Uh, so that's, that's one part. And second is we do, we have a rigorous monitoring system. And in Prisma so far, we have interviewed more than 20,000 farmers. We have more than a million data points. And that gives us a very important, um, crucial insights for the farmers have the, you know, they have experienced um, profitability, whether they have used that, whether they have the improved agency, whether they have the network, and, and, and if there is any um, external shocks, whether they can um, you know, continue uh, practicing or continue you know, delivering, um, continuing their uh, behavior changes that, that has happened due to the program. Um, so, so from that perspective, we look at, we look at farmers, but it's really, it's really so we, we, we reached 1.2 million farmers. It is really difficult to like think about each and every community and, and, and say from, you know, say whether they have the improved um, resilience or not. Um, but as I said, like we don't uh, leave them alone. Mm, fascinating. Okay. Um, so the, the other question, the other, I said I wanted to broaden out the conversation. Um, the, other, the other question that, that was brought up by, um, by Dan Norrell again was about, um, climate a climate perspective i mean obviously livestock um production is tends to be um you know have a, a fairly have a higher carbon footprint than than the agricultural production more generally um encourage you know if more consumption of meat is increases people's carbon footprint at a household level you know did you look at have you thought about the the, the programs work from a climate perspective or what are your what would you say to people who might question the the legitimacy of um, encouraging uh, perhaps higher carbon um, diets, for example. Now we're all looking at each other. Who's going to answer? <laughs> um, I'll hand it over. Yes, the question is, yes, we have been um, looking at our um, climate smart agriculture or innovations are actually probably integral to a lot of the work that we're doing. And um, I think, you know, my um, chief technical officer on inclusion and engagement did um, let me know that 47% of our in, in interventions already have elements of climate smart agriculture, but that's not your question. Um, what are we doing? I'll hand it over to Mohassan, who's more um, uh, at the uh, coal face of what we're doing um, with our climate smart um, ag, but certainly what we're doing at the moment is that we're actually measuring that um, uh, gas reduction um, as a result of our uh, climate smart um, work. So, Mohassan? Yeah. So there are a couple of perspectives. So from the very beginning, we're um, careful of this. And um, so uh, when we are promoting the concentrated feed, farmers definitely shifted um, you know, from using forage to concentrated feed, and that contributed positively. So that's, that's one. Uh, at the same time, we were also uh, sharing information uh, through the private sector on uh, good uh, wearing practices. That also contributed positively. Uh, finally, again, and this is related to the approach that we followed during this crisis, which is the hybrid approach. And you can actually implement the essence of this approach when you, uh, when you think about climate change. So for example, we um, thought about the methane emission by, 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 by the cattle. And, um, and, and uh, if you really look at the adaptation uh, perspective, from the adap adaptation perspective, it's a, it has a public good nature, so nobody wants to invest upfront. So what we are doing right now, we have partnered with uh, one Australian company and one Indonesian company, and we are uh, you know, testing a new technology called molasses leak block, 
so farmers they will um, uh, use this block and when uh, the cattle uh, leaks those blocks uh, the the productivity increases at the same time methane emission reduces so we are testing that so we're investing upfront um, we are we are uh, at the same time, we are doing that based on co-investment, but we are doing this upfront and we are doing this research. The end game is very simple. So we want to create this prototype and we want to share that with the wider markets, all the input companies and also the associations, um, you know, the dairy processing uh, organizations, farmer cooperatives, so that there is a common understanding that there is a product available um, and that that could be used to, to reduce methane. Thank you. Could I add some example from the pig quickly? Yes, yeah, please. What we mentioned about the wastewater treatment, this is a first of its kind in any livestock uh, farm in Indonesia. Two of our farmers have applied this wastewater treatment management system, which obviously helps the farm become more biosecure, but also uh, lessens um, carbon footprint for pig farmers because the two farms that I've applied are probably one of the biggest big farms I've seen in this province. And uh, not only are they recycling the water for farm use again, they are able to produce biogas from it. And then further, uh, the solid waste is can be used as compost. And uh, this kind of happened organically as we started working with them and farms also wanted better solution to be able to address some of these uh, challenges. And if you ask me, this will also help the farm move up and be able to be uh, certified ASF free, you know, and especially when they're going to sell their semen in the market, uh, they, they would need that kind of a certification, uh, which is like a standard from the government. So this is a great example of a livestock farm uh, applying wastewater treatment, which is really impacting uh, the pig sector or any kind of livestock sector in Indonesia. Well, thank you. That's very, very informative answers. I think it's also worth pointing out just as a broader context um, with a global um, carbon footprint per, per person is about 4.7 tons a year. In Indonesia, it's less than two. And that's in Indonesia as a whole. I imagine on in NTT, the, carbon, the average carbon footprint per individual is way, way below that. So um, while it's important to address these issues, um, let's let's put it in the context of, the, of these. This is an area with very um, low carbon footprint to begin with. Yeah. Um, thank you, guys. We've reached the end of the hour. Um, it's been a really, really informative webinar and extremely, extremely articulately and eloquently presented. And I'm sure everyone has appreciated it as much as I have. Thank you very much for your, for your presentations, Nina, Mysin, um, Prajwal. There is, I'd like to ask everyone who's, who's been listening in, please to give some feedback on the webinar. Um, with, there's a link in the chat box that my colleague Isabel has just posted. Um, where you can give us like take 30 seconds and just let us know what you thought about the webinar. We really appreciate your feedback um, and it helps us obviously improve web our future webinars. And I hope that we will have um, we'll have the privilege of, of listening to you guys again at some point in the future. I know there's a lot more going, a lot, lot more going on on Prisma and I'm sure you'll, you'll want to share some of your other experiences. But this today was really fantastic and I'd just like to say thanks. Great. Thank you. It's thank been you. a pleasure being here. Same here. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone who attended. Take care.